This is a 44 Magnum cartridge, the kind of cartridge I'm going to be using for deer hunting this fall with a handgun. This is the handgun I'm going to use. Will we be able to use handguns in southern Michigan? I don't know. Representative Jerry Bartnick is here with some answers on that. We're going to talk with Larry Kelly about registering and getting the permits for handguns, which I had to go through for this one. I'm going to show you a little bit with some great videotape on dry snapping, dry firing these guns, which doesn't hurt them at all, but can improve your accuracy. You stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again at all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow And the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold The wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can It tells you of the beauty in this state of Michigan Man. Magnaport International, an important name in the shooting world for its recoil reduction process, is also the new headquarters for the Handgun Hunters Hall of Fame. Located in Mount Clements, the Hall of Fame is open to the public, free of charge, and displays mounted game taken by handgun hunters all over the world. Big bore handguns for sporting purposes, that's target, metallic silhouette shooting, and hunting, have come a long way as a legitimate way of taking game. Larry Kelly is at the top of the list of handgun hunters, and when I became interested in shooting handguns and buying a handgun, Larry was the logical guy for me to talk to, especially to help unravel our fairly complex handgun laws. In using a gun, what, what am I going to have to do in buying a gun? I don't own a handgun right now. Is it a big deal? What, I go down and, and well, I don't think it's a big deal because I'm used to it. My first gun, I went through the same procedure that you'll go through now. They say that there's no gun control. Uh, in the state of Michigan, there's always been gun control, as far as I know. What you do is you uh, go to your local police department, and you uh, apply for a purchasing permit. And it'll take two to ten weeks, depending on uh, what city or township you're in. Now, that's in order to buy to purchase a, handgun? a handgun? To purchase a handgun. Do I have to tell them exactly what handgun I'm going to no, purchase? No, you do not. All you're doing is applying for a purchasing permit. Okay. which gives you the right to purchase a handgun. Now, can I only purchase one handgun on that permit? On that permit, one handgun, yes. Well, what if I wanted to buy two handguns? I go and get two permits? Two permits. Okay. Yes. One for each gun. And that takes two to ten weeks? Yeah, it's different in different townships. Some townships, uh, they have where you can only go in there uh, uh, certain hours one day a week. Uh, they don't make it easy for us. Well, how come so many people say anybody can buy a handgun? Well, I always, uh, I always uh, couldn't figure that out either because uh, you, nobody can just go out and buy a handgun. Yeah, well, you remember Well, they have them for sale at Meyer Thrifty Acres and other places. Well, I, I don't used to. They're for stuff. sale, but they can't sell them to you unless you have a purchasing permit. So if I was going to buy this handgun, I go through the permit, I go buy it from you, pay you, well, and then you'd, I have you'd to... get your purchasing permit from your local police department. Uh -huh. You come in with the purchasing permit. It has to be signed and notarized. And then there, we have a yellow form, you'll fill that out, and you'll swear to all different uh, statements that you're not involved in drug, uh, no crimes, you're not a felon, so on. Now, that's a, this is a form you have? Yeah. Okay. And we have to fill that out. Then we take one copy of your purchasing permit, give you the other two copies. You go back to the police department, and you present the gun and the two copies of the purchasing permit. Then they will type out and issue you a safety card, which is really a registration card. Mm -hmm. So they know which gun I have, the serial number. That goes, gun is registered. Goes right in the computer. But but the thing of it is, is if you were, you know, to quickly go through it, say you saw a gun you wanted it uh, down here today, a Magnaport. I know you don't usually, you know, sell retail or whatever, but say you wanted to buy one from Larry. You have to, or you want to buy one from anybody, you have to find out which gun you want first. We're down in Mount Clemens. If you decide on a gun today, we have to go back to Lansing without the gun, get it all lined up with a permit to purchase, which takes that amount of time that Larry's was talking about, two to ten weeks, then drive all the way down to Mount Clemens, pick the gun up, fill out all the forms down here, including you've got thumbprints along the way, too. You mean so we can't and do this through the mail? No. Oh. And then you've got to go right on back to, uh, since you don't live in a city, you've got to go right down to Mason, 
Michigan in order to take that gun back down there and, and, and register it and have it safety inspected at that point. So you're talking about a process right now we're looking at several hundred miles minimum and uh, a month, six weeks. And how much is they going to nick me for that? What's it going to cost? Well, very few townships uh, and cities charge, but some are charging now a $2 or $5 filing fee. Uh, but after you receive, after you purchase your firearm, and okay, you have, say I, I own it, and it's, it's registered, mine. Uh, this only entitles you to keep this firearm in your home. You can't carry it on your person. Uh, if you're going to take it to the target range or t uh, for hunting, you have to have the registration card with the firearm enclosed in a case in the rear of the vehicle the same laws pertain to as uh, in transporting a rifle for you know when you're going hunting. and but except on a pistol you have to have the shells in some other compartment of the vehicle you have to have the shells up in the uh, glove compartment or whatever but it's got to be locked up and inaccessible when it's in the vehicle with this permit if you go to take your 22 pistol out and decide to go rabbit hunting you better make darn sure that shells are separated from the gun and while you're out hunting you should, I have to carry the permit with me. Right, and you should never, ever let even your coat, even if it's raining, flop over your handgun because they're guilty of concealed, concealed weapons. weapons. Felony, five years. So if I go through all of this, I still have to get a concealed weapons permit if I want to put it under my coat? While you're hunting, to keep it out of the rain, you have to get a concealed weapons permit. Holy and that God. doesn't entitle you to carry a concealed any other time except, except while you're hunting. You can get a target one also to carry it concealed at the target. Not concealed in the car going out to the target range or out to hunt, but concealed while you're hunting. So I go through all of this and I get this gun. I can't just say, use it for personal protection. In your home, you can. In your home. Yeah, but yes. I can't keep it under the seat of my car. No way. No way. I can't, no way. Uh, if I'm down into the dangerous parts of uh, no Detroit way. or any city, no. I can't carry it with me. No. No, no way. What no. would happen if I did? I got You'd a, be arrested. Five-year felony. Oh, no, that's a little too much to monkey with there. See, that's what I don't understand. The, the do-gooders, uh, the anti-gun people are saying, you know, they're screaming for gun control. We have gun control here in Michigan. Well, it's very stringent. You know, it must be that these easy-to-get guns, they're talking black market guns, just like they're talking well, they're heroin illegal and, guns. and stolen right. guns. Yeah. Yeah. So handguns. I, uh, I think I am going to go handgun hunting for deer. I mean, am I taking a, a real shot in the dark, so to speak, on that? Not really, because handgun hunting is, is really growing uh, across the United States, and uh, it's... Well, it may grow, but how will I be able to do deer hunting? Well, I mean, you, you do real well with uh, some instructions and understanding the gun and uh, taking reasonable shots, you do real well. You're talking about me giving up a rifle Well. that I can rest on a branch and... Well, you can, you can rest that gun, too, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I think once you do hunt with it and you connect with a deer, uh, I don't think you'll be using the rifle anymore. <laughs> I've learned a lot from Larry Kelly about handguns and shooting handguns, but the most important thing to remember if you want to be accurate in handgunning is to squeeze the trigger. It's basic, but the most important aspect of all shooting skills. Now watch the squeeze. Dry snapping modern handguns doesn't hurt the firing pin at all, and this really is the best way to practice, believe it or not. See me squeeze the trigger? The reason for a slow, steady squeeze is so you can hold the barrel steady. If the barrel moves just a smidgen before you fire, you miss. Now that was perfect. And now let's look through the hunting scope at this hanging metallic silhouette. My eye can't be behind the scope while the camera's looking through it, so OJ gives me some instructions in the background. But watch, when I snap, watch the crosshairs. They stay on the target. Now that's a good squeeze, and I'd make a hit. But here's what affects accuracy, though. A loaded gun, that big 44 Magnum barks and kicks and very often causes a flinch in shooters after just a couple of shots. The kick on a short-barreled 44 is substantial, and it intimidates shooters. Now watch this shot in slow motion. Watch how high the muzzle jumps with the big bore handgun. That's what affects the slow, steady trigger squeeze more than anything. So I now have a round loaded, and watch how my finger wiggles while I'm squeezing. Watch it wiggles right there. See that? That was a flinch. I would have missed. Now, let's take a look 
through the scope here with the live round in the chamber. Now, I'm not at all as steady as I was when I knew the gun was empty. Again, just before I fire, I jiggle the barrel off the target. No wonder I missed. In the last second, when I was bracing myself for the recoil, I pushed the barrel down. Now you can see in the slow motion replay that at the point the bullet was fired, I was off the target, right there, low, way low. That's the effect of recoil and flinching, even if it's slight. Now look how steady I was with the dry snap. Look at that, right on, before, after, during the squeeze, those crosshairs stayed right on the target. That's the key to accuracy. But we're only really concerned about where the barrel is pointing at the point that the bullet goes off. See that? I hit the target. Now, I, I hit because during my flinch, I pulled the barrel up. Watch. Now, here's a case where an uncontrolled flinch put the sights back on the lower outside corner just at the time the hammer fell. Right there. I just caught the lower corner. Squeeze the trigger. That's the key to successful handgun hunting in Michigan outdoors. I wished our handgun laws were as simple as squeezing the trigger, but they're not. And I must caution you, we've stated the laws uh, to the best of our knowledge as to their accuracy, but different police agencies interpret these laws slightly differently. So play it safe and make sure you know the handgun laws, the concealed weapon laws, before you get a handgun and go out hunting with it. And this is the time of year when fishermen can be lucky and maybe hunters too, and you might make our trophy book. This fall's bear season has been a good one, especially in the Upper Peninsula, and especially for Ron Kiefer from Sunfield, hunting near Sini with a big bore handgun, properly registered with all the necessary permits, I'm sure. He took this 430 pound black bear. Congratulations, Ron, lots of good eating there. That's one of the biggest black bears of the year. And for our few and far between fall anglers, take a look at this Great Lakes muskie that Dan Shillong from Livonia caught exactly a year ago this week, trolling a believer in Lake St. Clair. I imagine Dan had plenty of elbow room on the lake at this time of year, and this is the kind of fish that can be caught. If it's a fight you're after, don't look down your nose at this critter. It's a bowfin, commonly called a dogfish, and at 28 inches, this one was full of scrap. Had to be. Steve Nagy from Petersburg caught it on a minnow fishing Round Lake, Lenaway County, a little over a week ago. And although the lake trout season has been closed in Lakes Michigan and Huron for nearly two months, the lake trout must be an extremely popular fish among anglers. We get a lot of entries. This one, 36 inches long, 18 and a half pounds. That put a smile on the face of Terry Weiland from Stryker, Ohio, who was trolling a billy bait off Holland on the last day of the lake trout season, August 15th. Pink salmon have taken a hold in the Great Lakes, obviously captured the fancy of quite a few anglers. We have lots of entries in this category too, like this nearly four pounder taken by Gary Heinrich from Utica. He was casting a spinner in Trout River, Presque Isle County, that's a northwestern part of the Lower Peninsula, when this 23 incher hit and put Gary in the trophy book. Now this fish is not one of our glamour fish in Michigan, but Marsha Day from Royal Oak is holding the catch that earned her the new state record for red horse sucker. Fishing Lake St. Clair with a night crawler on a crappie rig, 10 pounds, one ounce, tops the trophy book for Red Horse Sucker, making Marsha Day from Royal Oak our Michigan Outdoors Master Angler of the Week. It seems, Bob, that legislators must be a little squeamish just about passing even a rather innocuous handgun law like this. Well, what we see, it really is good news because hunters can explain mm -hmm. what this, what this uh, bill does. And if they do it in great enough numbers, hey, it's going to pass. Oh, fingers crossed, sportsmen's fingers crossed. I would certainly look forward to that season. Bob, I have a question here for you on Hunter Orange. Matt Flaminio from Kennesec writes, is it illegal to hunt without Hunter Orange? There's been a law change, Fred, as you well know, this year, and that is, is that you have to wear Hunter Orange on private property, too. Last before, year... Before, only on lands right. open to the public. Last year, you could avoid Hunter Orange if you wished on your own land, but this year, you must have a coat or as I carry in my day pack, fanny pack, a couple things here which also satisfy the law, a cap with a bill, 
or a knit hat would also do. Use this during rabbit season That's when it right. gets cold. Or you could rather inexpensively at the store just buy a little plastic vest like that. That'll fulfill the requirements of the law. Any one of those will still fulfill the requirements. And it saves lives and cuts down on hunting accidents dramatically. The more the better. Fred, a question too from Dean Coffee of Howell for you. He says, I hunt southern Michigan in very heavy cover. I've found 12 rubs on trees and four scrapes on the ground in an area less than 100 yards square. Would these scrapes be territorial or breeding scrapes? Well, I'm not sure, Dean, what a territorial or breeding scrape is, and most biologists don't. Here's a picture of a scrape, which is an area on the ground a couple feet in diameter that a buck deer makes by pawing and using his antlers, often under a low-hanging branch. What it means? We don't know. We do know that the bucks tend to come back to these areas, but then again, they follow the same trails frequently as well. Now, rubs, you said you found 12 rubs. Rubs like this right in the middle of the picture there are very, very common. Bucks make oftentimes many rubs in one day. They'll thrash the branches with their antlers. This is during the rut. They get mean and surly. Uh, they don't come back to those uh, rubs. So hunting around them, it can tell you they're bucks in the area, but don't get too enamored with sitting by a rub or a scrape. Sometimes they work and sometimes they you don't. You can sit there an awful long time. That's right. I might suggest to some of you folks who might want to slip out for a little bass fishing. We have Ed Groves coming up with Bob Knopf during a bull hunt two years ago where they nailed a bass right off the bat. That's going to be coming up in just a second. But first, let's see if you can answer the question to this week's Outdoor Quiz. 30 years ago, the number of hunters who pursued game with a bow numbered in the thousands. How many bow hunters are licensed in the United States today? According to the Wildlife Management Institute, one out of every 15 hunters today is a bow hunter. There are 15 million licensed hunters nationwide and 1,250,000 licensed bow hunters. Well, Fred, I'm out here with Bob Noth, and we were just getting ready to do this segment. We want to talk about fall bass fishing. I put on a jig and threw it on the water, and look what I got here. <laughs> what do you think there, Bob? Not a bad looking well, fish, not huh? Not bad for the first cast. You got a landing yeah, for yeah, me let here? Me, let me get him up here. I couldn't believe it. We were just practicing. I was just throwing it out there. We were just kind of talking, and he said, that's not too bad for the fish. That's not a bad looking. Today, no. What do you think that goes? Oh, that's about a 14, 15 Yeah, inch. nice one. Small mile. We're using a good bait for this yep, time. Yep, using a jig. Go ahead, put him back in that water. Yeah, we'll, we'll turn him back and let him grow up a little bit. All right. There he goes. Well, let's continue here. Great. Now I'll get my lure. And <laughs> talking with Bob Knopf from the Berkeley Line Company, and we want to talk about fall bass fishing and uh, the difference between fall bass fishing and, and summer bass fishing. What's, give us some tips here. Well, when they go out there in the summer, the bass are generally deep, and it's uh, kind of hard to catch it. And if you look at what we got on our lines, uh -huh. it probably will show us about okay. the most. Uh -huh. Which you caught your bass, since you caught the fish, we'll talk right. about what okay. you got on. But we've got a, a jig here, and this mm -hmm. is a garland jig, which is, a, there's a there's a lead head right inside right. here. There's some weight there. And there, it's about a quarter ounce jig, and we've put a rubber body on it with a skirt. Mm -hmm. And this is one technique that works real well in the fall, and you throw it out, and you work it along the bottom like you were doing, uh -huh. and particularly uh, working the drop-offs and the outer weed edges is the best place. Right. This is a kind of a slow presentation. As the water goes a little, gets a little bit colder, you can put a minnow on this, uh -huh. and then that'll take you clean into November or even December for fishing. Okay, well, how, how before you get into your bait, how are bass different? I want to throw this out a couple more times. I want to try to get another bass. Okay, well, how, how are fall bass different than than, uh, than summer bass? The water's starting to co get colder, and so the bass are, are moving from the deep water areas, and they're kind of concentrating on the weed edges and on uh, the drop-offs. Uh -huh. And so what you have to do is you have to work your bait along the weeds, the drop-offs, especially the steep drop-offs. Now these smallmouth that were that you caught here, they're in here on the, on the drop-off and they're in the rocky area. Right. So if a, if a person wants to catch smallmouth or some other sort of bass, then they want to look for the, the steep drop-offs where it goes right right down, okay. where it's a little bit rocky, or if they don't have that in the lake that they fish, they want to fish on the outer edge of the weed. Uh -huh. And if you use, like, if they start out today, it works real good to put on something like, I've got a crankbait on Okay. Here. And what this is, it's kind of a fast retrieve. And if the fish are active, they can throw this out and, and reel it in quick. And if they're active, they'll catch a bunch of fish on it. If this doesn't work, I normally start out with this. And if this didn't work, then I put on the, the jig that you're using, mm -hmm. and I'd give that a try. Holiday season is coming. It's time, I think, that we do something uh, Oh, a little, festive. <laughs> little festive, a little clever right. here. What is this, Kathy? It's a salmon ball, and you find a lot of salmon cheese balls around mm -hmm. this time of year. 
This looks good. You're so, going to have some, Bob? Are you kidding me? <laughs> are you feeling okay? <laughs> give, me that, give me that piece, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, you just sort of sat there. Yeah, we're I know. Just a couple together. of these little rye breads, too. That would... A salmon ball. This was made with some of our Michigan salmon, I hope. Right. It's something you can do if you've got salmon left over from, we got cream cheese in it and red hot, just for some flavor. Some parsley flakes we've used fresh. And your salmon. You know, this was left over. And it can be boiled or broiled or grilled. And then we're going to flake it. And you want it kind of small flakes. You can break it up with a fork after you've broken it up with your hands. Remove any bones if you come across any, which I did. Oh, yeah, you find bones, some of those that come off of the ribs. Right. Now yeah, is I the best time to those. remove them rather that's, than in the dip. That's <laughs> right, before you add your cream cheese. They're a lot harder to remove. They stick together. We're going to add two packages of cream cheese. And the cream cheese is real mild. You don't mm -hmm. want a strong yellow cheese that will uh, kill your flavor. And a lot of balls like this have onions in it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, a lot of seasoning and I You don't want it with the salmon because it's so mild anyway. Oh, well, there's some seasoning. Well, Cayenne some. We're sauce. supposed to use two drops for it. Yeah, but I can't believe the two drops of hot sauce in any recipe <laughs> That's right. is worth anything. So we add a little bit more, and you really don't taste it. Okay, you can use parsley. We use fresh, which is a lot more flavorful. Shape it into a ball. And if you put it in the refrigerator and let it set for just a few minutes, it will firm up just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. A lot easier to shape. Roll it in your parsley, and there you go. Roll it in the parsley, and this is what we have right here. What do you think, Bob? I think this is just stupendous. Another suggestion I might make, too, is don't be afraid to put smoked salmon in it. Because mm -hmm. that right. would be good, too. Or salmon that was grilled mm -hmm. on an outdoor mm -hmm. grill. I often grill salmon at this time of year, pop it in the grill, and, um, and it, it's good, just leftover, mm -hmm. cold. But this is amazing because, like you said, it doesn't have the onions in it. It doesn't right. have the it's spices. Just real mild. I can't even taste the hot sauce. No, I, I didn't think you if could. We have some here. I'll put some more on. You've really got it. You know, this is really neat too because with some olives and tomatoes or whatever to munch along with it. But you know, great. It, it great. tastes like right? like a seafood. Mm -hmm. It really does. It doesn't taste to me like salmon. It tastes like a crab dip or even a clam Absolutely. dip. Absolutely. Your cream cheese is going to mild out I, I wonder, the fish. Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. A cream cheese makes it taste more yep. like a seafood dip. Great yep. stuff. Excellent. Kid. Excellent. A holiday salmon ball. Bob, why don't you tell the folks how they can get a hold of this recipe? Well, it's very stringent. You know, it must be that these easy-to-get guns, they're talking black market guns, just like they're talking well, they're heroin illegal and, guns, and right. stolen guns. Yeah. So handguns. I uh, I think I am going to go handgun hunting for deer. I mean, am I taking a, a real shot in the dark, so to speak, on that? Not really, because handgun hunting is is really growing uh, across the United States, and uh, you do real well with uh, some instructions and understanding the gun and uh, taking reasonable shots. You do real well. You're talking about me giving up a rifle. Well, that I can rest on a branch and. Well, you can, you can rest that gun, too, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I think once you do hunt with it and you connect with a deer, uh, I don't think you'll be using the rifle anymore. <laughs>